you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Everyone under 40 right now is leaning to the person next to them saying, what is that thing on the screen? <clears throat> For those who don't recognize it, this is what radios used to look like. Uh, I remember actually very well in my, uh, I had an Isuzu pickup truck when I was a freshman in college, and uh, it came with just the standard AM, FM, uh, and we upgraded to the cassette player, uh, which was a pretty big deal, but it still had the dials and knobs on the side, so when you hear that term uh, on the radio dial, uh, this is what it's talking about, and so instead of 99.9 .9 or whatever, I have no idea what that is in ADA, by the way, so if that's a bad station, I'm sorry, uh, but instead of whatever point whatever and you get to there digitally, you would have to turn this little knob just right as you're driving down the bumpy road uh, trying to get along, and you would just catch where it was, and if you went a little too far, it would go, and then as you drove in and out of areas, you would find that station kind of changing and coming and going and all of those things. Communication is kind of like that isn't it? You know, how many times have you said something and you've watched the reaction of the other person and you realize pretty quickly they did not hear what I was trying to say? Uh, I would imagine you know, marriage sometimes can be a series of that. If you have something in mind and you say it and you can tell immediately as tones and, and postures and everything change of, okay, that's not what I was trying to say. I was trying to say something totally different than that. And then when we have our other relationships, our work relationships and friendships and neighbors and all of those things, it's kind of the same deal where you will say something hoping to say one thing and people take it another way. Uh, Jet and I, as we've been teaching this class on Wednesday evenings, uh, there was one time that we had a conversation after based on just kind of a reaction of, that really wasn't what I was trying to say, or at least what I thought I was saying. Clearly, that was not what was coming across. And it, we just kind of have a series of that in life. And a lot of shows we watch on TV, they're kind of built on the idea of miscommunication. You know, something, something happens, it's taken in a different way, it becomes funny and everyone laughs at it. And when it's on TV, it's kind of funny. When it's in our lives, it can be kind of complicated. Uh, and so as Paul gets into chapter 4 here in Colossians, I think if we were to choose a theme of what he's talking about, it's communication. Uh, and what communication should look, for us, look, look like for us as Christians. Uh, and so we're going to look this morning at four kinds of Christ, Christian communication that Paul talks about or gives examples of, I think, here in Colossians chapter 4. So as he begins uh, in Colossians chapter 4, and I, I, this is one of those chapter divisions that I really don't understand uh, because the, the verse 1 clearly is about what he was talking about at the end of chapter 3. Uh, and in most of your Bibles, if you have paragraphs and headings and all of that, you have a new one that starts in verse 2. Uh, and so we will begin in verse 2 at looking at how, what he says about communication uh, and I be, believe he begins, begins by talking about communication with God. Uh, and I love that as we've been talking about prayer on Wednesday evenings, he centers in on this same idea of what it is to have this prayer life with God. And so as you look to what our communication with God should look like, uh, it, is, it is this in verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. We almost gloss over the first word. Because we, we think of steadfastly and thanksgiving and all those things, but notice he begins with continue. It's as if it was already going on, isn't it? Because when you continue something, you don't start steadfastly in prayer, continue steadfastly in prayer. There's almost just this assumption that if you're a Christian, prayer is going to be part of what you do. Uh, and so if you've not been here on Wednesday evenings, one of the quotes we looked at last week was something like, I'll get it wrong again, but uh, it was a quote from Martin Luther that said something along the lines of, being a Christian without prayer is like being alive without breathing. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And so Paul says, continue. And what he describes in prayer is that communication with God should be constant and it should be thankful. Or if we want to think of it in different terms, maybe it should be positive, it should be optimistic. Our communication with God is a communication that shows <clears throat> we believe this is worthwhile. We believe when we talk to God and we have requests that He is able to do those things. We believe that when we talk to God that we're not just speaking to air. You know, there, there are people in our world that don't understand God and what He's about that feel like when you pray, that is just wasted breath. Why would you bother with that? It's not like he's going to respond to you or anything like that. And Paul would say the way you pray is constant, it is ongoing, and it's thankful. 
So for us, I think as we look at that, we probably don't struggle with thankful. Maybe we don't do that as much as we should, but most of us, I feel like, you know, especially this time of year, we, we understand the idea of being thankful to God. We, we look at the things in our lives, the people in our lives, and we feel like God has blessed us with those. Constant is where we struggle, and we've talked about that quite a bit on Wednesday evenings. The idea of how do you pray constantly? How do you pray without ceasing? And we've tried to define that in a number of ways, but I, I think I, I read something this week that I really like from Thomas Kelly in his book, Testament of Devotion. He says, there's a way of ordering our mental life on more than one level at once. Do we have any multitaskers among us? Uh, my kids are kind of of that, uh, that age group that when they will do homework with a class, <clears throat> they will have AirPods in, uh, they will be texting someone on their phone, uh, the TV is on, and they're doing homework. Uh, for me, I can't even listen to music because there are other words, and I need the words on the page, uh, and I don't get that, but they, they can do all that at once, and they actually kind of struggle when they turn off some of those noises to be able to center in on the thing they're wanting to do. And so what he says here is your, your mind's in different places all at the same time. On one level, we can be thinking, discussing, seeing, calculating, and meeting all the demands of external affairs. So just life is going on on one hand. But deep within, beneath the scenes, at a profounder level, we may also be in prayer and adoration, song and worship, and a gentle receptiveness to divine breathings. So as you're doing things, there is something resting beneath the surface that is still there connected to God. Uh, yesterday, my wife made me do all kinds of work around the house. No, I, I was helping her do all kinds of work around the house. She was doing more than me, though. Uh, and in the midst of that, I caught myself singing to myself, uh, Lord, make us instruments of your peace, which somebody led last Sunday. I don't remember who did, which is probably why it was in her head. And I realized at some point she was singing it, which then put it into my head. And as I'm washing dishes and cleaning things up and doing all these things, I'm thinking about being instruments of God's peace. It's this. It's as we work at different levels, what God wants of us is for the primary foundational level of all that to be Him. And so when you continue constantly and thankfully in prayer, this is kind of what it looks like. It's not always a dear God, something, then an amen. It is just this ongoing conversation relationship with God. Secondly, he talks about communication with and about the church. Now, I kind of cheated here a little bit because he talks more about the church in chapter 4, but we're going to remind ourselves of something he said in chapter 3 where he talks about communication with the church. So in verse 3, he says, At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So he wants prayers on his behalf for what he's going to say, for how that relates to the church. And if we back up to chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, but now you, and he's talked about all the ways you used to talk, you must put them all away, anger and wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and may put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So you have this way you used to think and talk, and now among you, one another, you're going to think and talk differently. There's communication going on over there, I know. Uh, I love hearing that. <clears throat> we think and talk with one another in a different way because of the Christian bond that we have. And we have an impact on the lives of one another because of the Christian bond that we have. Communication with and about the church should be honest, do not lie to one another, and it should be motivational. And motivational in a, in a couple different ways. Uh, if you read the bulletin article this week, there is a side of motivational that is sometimes we need to call one another out on where we're falling short. And there's another side of motivational that is sometimes we need to pick each other up when we are falling short, and dust each other off, and encourage one another on to the next and better thing. And so our communication within the church, honest and motivational. And I will tell you that if that was what everyone experienced within church life, you would not hear stories about people who left because of something somebody said. And all of us know one. And all of us have probably said something we regret saying and wish we could do it in a different way. We should be honest and motivational with each other. Then he continues on. Uh, communication for Christians also should be the way we communicate with the world. So our communication with the world, and the challenge for us, by the way, is this is done in word and in what we do. Uh, have you ever talked to someone who... 
Guys uh, who are married, you have experienced this, I almost would guarantee it. When you look to your wife and it seems like something's wrong, and so you ask what's wrong, and she says nothing. Or maybe you look to her and you say, <clears throat> what did I do? And she says, nothing. Or, or how are you? And she says, okay. And you know it's not okay, and everything about body language says it's not okay, or wives, maybe you talk to your husbands, or just those among us who talk to one another, you see one thing in words and something else in what's going on. Or maybe you see one thing in words and something else in the actions that we do or what we value. So our communication with the world is communicated in a lot of different ways. He says in verse 5, walk in wisdom towards outsiders. So walking the way we live, we do that wise because the people around us are watching. And there are a group of people within our world that love to watch Christians mess up. So they can point it out, they can tell us that we're just like everybody else, that there's nothing special about the God that we follow. And so he says, be careful about how you walk, making the best use of the time. So be careful, don't waste your time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. <clears throat> so communication with the world should be intentional. You're making the best use of the time, and it should be kind. You have this grace seasoned with salt kind of idea that we're going to interact with the world in a way that understands they don't have the same value system that we have. And that's probably a struggle for us as much as at any point in history because there was a time when our world kind of did have the same value system we had. It was very similar at least, and we're not there anymore. And so when we interact, we have to do it in an intentional way, understanding the impact we have, the influence we have, the good or bad it could mean for the church because of what we say and what we do. And it has to be kind. We have to understand that these are people that God created and values, and he wants to have a relationship with them, and we are kind of the in-between that can help out with that. And then, <clears throat> communication with and about our close relationships. So there are people that we know that are kind of out there, and there are people uh, within the church that we're closer to and not as close to. There are people within the world we have an impact on, but then there are those people that when things get hard, they're the ones you call. They're, they're those people that when you need help, they're the ones you call on. They're those people when there's a, a celebration in life, they're the ones you talk to. There are those people that are the closest of the close. They're your family. They're your really close friends. And Paul says, well, what does communication with them look like? And I believe what he does here is begin to give us a lot of examples. So we're going to look at each of these that he, he looks at throughout the rest of the chapter and just notice something about them. So he begins. He says, Tychicus will tell you about my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, how we are and that he, he may encourage your hearts. So Tychicus is a faithful encourager. And what you'll see as Paul begins to name these people is, they're filling all kinds of roles within Paul's life, but Paul knows them well enough to see it. He can see that, you know, in this person, there is something that they do that no one else does quite in that way. So Tychicus, he is faithful to this group, to me, and he encourages. And so when I need to be built up, Tychicus is the guy you want to, you want to seek out. And then verse 9, he says, And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. And so we learn of Onesimus, he is one of them, so they know him, he's kind of part of their group. He is faithful, both to them and to Paul, and he's attentive because he's the one that's going to tell them everything that's going on. Uh, we have kind of an ongoing thing within our, our family as our boys are growing up. If they had a medical appointment of some kind, my job tends to be more flexible because, as you know, preachers only work on Sundays and Wednesdays. Uh, but I could get out of the office a little easier than my wife could most of the time. But if I go to the doctor's office instead of her and I come back and she says, what did they say? I'll be like a one-sentence answer. And she doesn't really know what they've said. And so I will generally say, would you mind going along on whatever this is because you're going to know the right questions to ask. You'll be able to know what happened in the end. And when they need to take some sort of medication or something, you, you will know how to explain it. And otherwise, they will probably die and it will be my fault. So let's have you do that instead of me. Onesimus is this guy who, attention to detail, is clearly part of what he does. Get too much nodding, Nathan. Uh, attention to detail is part of what he does because he's going to be the one to relay the story. Then he continues on in verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner greets you and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. 
And so we see two very different things in these guys. Aristarchus is committed. Because if he is a fellow prisoner, and we learn about Aristarchus in other places in the New Testament, if we know of him that he is one who is with Paul, it's not just a guy he met in prison. He is one who is following Jesus and doing it in such a way that he is imprisoned alongside Paul. He is as committed as Paul is about this. And so Aristarchus is somebody that can be counted on. And then Mark. And I love this. And there there are a lot of uh, Marks in the ancient world but most of the commentators agree that this is the same John Mark that we read about in the book of Acts where Paul has had enough of that guy and doesn't want him to come along on the trip, and Paul and Barnabas split ways over it. And then we learn later in Paul's letters that they have resolved somehow. We don't know exactly what that looked like or when it happened, but he calls for John Mark and wants him. And we learn as he mentions Mark here in all this group of positivity that Mark is forgiven. Whatever it is that he did, Uh, and most think that he deserted them somewhere along the way. Paul has gotten past that, or they've had a conversation, or both, and Mark is able to change. And for the people in Colossae, as they read this letter, there is somebody, or there's somebody who's connected to them that desperately needs that message. Whatever has defined you to this point does not have to define you forever. And so Mark is one who is forgiven. Then in verse 11, he says, "...and Jesus who is called justice..." And we'll call him Justice in a minute, just not to confuse. These are the only uh, the only men of the cir- these are I'm sorry these are the only men of the circumcision who um, uh, among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. So in Justice, you have someone who has overcome division, because if you were in this day and time in a Greek church, and you were the Jewish guy, you were probably one somewhere along the way who is either been a part of the group, as Paul talks about the group of circumcision, or maybe you've just outwardly said it, where what these Greeks need to do is get themselves circumcised and become Jews, good Jews, before they can be good Christians. And somewhere along the way, he begins to understand that's not how this works anymore. And so this dividing line that is there for them, that you have Jewish Christians and Greek Christians, and one group of them is going to sit on this side of the auditorium, and one group of them is going to sit on that side of the auditorium, Justice has overcome that, and he realizes that we are all together. And so whatever divides us, we set that aside here. And instead of that, we are first and foremost always followers of Jesus. That is the most important identifier that we have. And then he continues in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the Word of God. So back at the beginning of this, he says, constant in prayer, and then he gives an example. This Epaphras guy, he is always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. So Epaphras is faithful in prayer, and he's also a hard worker. And he is one that, you probably have people like this in your life, Something's going on in life and you think, you know, I really need other people praying for me about whatever this is. There are immediately people come to mind that you think, I'd really like to know that they're praying about me and praying for me. He is one that has put prayer into life to the point that Paul can describe him as always praying, constant in prayer. Verse 14, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Everybody needs to know a good doctor. So Luke, the beloved physician, he greets you, and Demas does as well. And so we find out that Luke and Demas, they are co-workers. These are people that are working alongside. And when you read through the book of Acts, which is written by Luke, there's a point in that book where it shifts from I or they to we, and you realize Luke is alongside them as they're going through these journeys, working alongside. So he is someone you can count on to be there with you, working together, and so is Demas. And then he says in verse 15, "'Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nymphia and the church at her house.'" And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see, uh, see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. So the church is family. They get these letters, they read them, they share them with one another, they find out this other church has a letter that gets shared with them. All of this works in communication as we are working together. And so Paul says that this family is so important within your life. And so share these things with each other. When you have learned, share that with your church family. And they share things with you, and we all get better as a result. 
In verse 17, he says, And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Archippus, and probably all of us, need to learn and be reminded to persevere. Archippus has this this ability, this goal, this call that he needs to follow, and Paul says, see to it that he does that. Uh, I remember vividly sitting with my uncle as he was dying, and he would kind of come in and out of being conscious, and he, he hit a point where he would talk so quietly you'd have to get really close in, <clears throat> and he pulled me in for something close one day, and he said to me, you need to finish school was so important to him that I finished college, and I had floundered for a long time at that point. And I said, I will. And I remember vividly when the diploma showed up at my house in the hard envelope, and I opened it up, and I pulled it out, and I saw it, and my first thought was, I did. You know, that, that thing that he thought was so important that he just wanted to make sure you do this. Paul says, Archippus has so important a call, encourage him along that way. Make sure he does it. Don't let him forget. And then he says in verse 18, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And I was reminded as I got to the end, and he's not naming other people anymore, maybe there should have been five kinds of Christian communication, which is communication that does not forget about others. Paul, who is distant and far away and lacking freedom, says, hey, don't forget about me. I'm still here. I'm still laboring away. And for all of us, it is so easy. I mean, when there are 300 and whatever of us, you know, it's so easy for somebody to slip through the cracks. And I hope if you have ever felt that way, you understand that there is no intent behind that. That th- This is not a group of people that wants to forget anybody, but it is so easy to miss somebody or to be missed. And so Paul says, don't forget. Think of those people in your own life that it's been a long time. And you thought, you know, I, I really should touch base with so-and-so. I, I wonder why they have not been here in a while. I, I wonder what it is that's going on in their lives. Or, or even people that have been here, but you just haven't really talked or had meaningful conversations. How, how can we reconnect as, as Christians together? Don't forget about each other. And I think all of us probably have one of those in our lives that we could think of and talk to and, and maybe encourage. Because communicating... It may be a little bit about what we say, but it's so much about what the other person hears. And so this morning, I I hope as you're here, what you hear is all of those different people that Paul lists that are kind of like us. You know, we we all have those moments where we need to be encouraged and prodded along. We all have moments we need to be reminded we've been forgiven. We, We all have times where you are the unique person that fits into a situation that it just needs you desperately. And we all are people that because of the bond we have in Christ, we're going to spend eternity together. So we might as well get used to each other right now before we get there. Today, if you have never followed him, you can take on that life. I I guarantee you it has its ups and downs, but it is so much better to live the way he designed. Or this morning, if you have been a part of the body and you've just fallen away for whatever reason, you need to come back. If you want to be baptized in him, come back to him. If there's some way we can help you, please come while we stand and sing.